I'm in church with my wife. The worship service is in full swing, and I feel a hand on my shoulder. It's Jerry, the ministry team leader. He's been praying in the back of the church and feels like God has a word of knowledge for me. He says God has given me a pastor's heart and that I need to continue raising my children in the things of God. He asks if any of that makes sense. I smile and say yes. He gives me a reassuring pat on the back, then walks back to his seat to do some more praying. Six months later, the same thing happens, this time with Sarah, another member of the ministry team. She pulls me aside and tells me that when I walked through the doors that morning, she saw joy. She wanted me to know that God was looking down on me at that moment to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Again, I smile and say thanks for the encouragement, and she goes on her way. Now, words of knowledge were nothing new to me. I had received many of them over the years during my Christian walk. But this time was different. See, for the last nine months, I had been a closet atheist. Only a handful of people knew about this. I still attended church. I clapped and sang during worship along with everyone else. Outwardly, nothing had changed. But behind the mask, I was frustrated. When Jerry asked me if his words made sense, what I really wanted to do was scream, no, they made absolutely no sense. I've never had a pastor's heart, and I'm standing here in full-blown apostasy, and your God doesn't have a clue. Now, if the two ministry team members had approached me nervously and said, look, I'm not sure if this is from God or not, but I feel he's telling me you're falling away from the faith. Please turn back before it's too late. I would have welcomed that message. To me, it would have been evidence that God was indeed the good shepherd who had come to save one of his sheep gone astray. But no, instead of receiving discipline, what I got were bland pep talks from a deity who was as much in the dark concerning my true spiritual condition as the ministry team was. Those two events sum up my experience with the supernatural. A lot of good intentions with very disappointing results. Of course, it didn't start out that way. When I was saved at that youth retreat in 1988, I remember the topic of Samuel coming up, how the angel of the Lord spoke his name, and he responded, Here I am, Lord, your servant is listening. The speaker encouraged us that if God ever spoke to us, we would need to respond like Samuel did. Well, I took his advice quite literally. A few months later, I thought I heard someone whisper my name in my room one night. So I immediately said, Here I am, Lord, your servant is listening, fully expecting to converse with the Almighty. Sadly, the angel of the Lord never responded. I admit I was a little disappointed, but I concluded I was just hearing things. Or maybe it was a test. I would just have to wait on the Lord, be patient, and in his time he would speak. After all, the God of the Bible was not a respecter of persons. He wanted to have a close personal relationship with all of his children. I just had to wait, be patient, everything according to his time. In my previous video, I mentioned that my home church was somewhat charismatic. They believed the gifts of the Spirit, like tongues and healing, were still in operation today, but they weren't a preoccupation. We weren't handling snakes or anything like that. However, where I got a full dose of the Holy Ghost was at the annual Full Gospel Businessmen's Retreat in Grantham, Pennsylvania. It was basically a five-day retreat for charismatic Christian businessmen and their families to fellowship and network. There were speakers and seminars, but most importantly, there were prophets who would take the time to minister in the miraculous. Prophets like Billy Burke. He was diagnosed with brain cancer at the age of nine then instantly healed by Catherine Kuhlman during one of her services. I was enthralled with the idea of a man who claimed to perform the same mighty works as the apostles. I remember standing in line twice to be ministered to, hoping to get slain in the spirit or whatever the Lord had for me. I earnestly sought to experience God's presence the same way I thought other people did. And I believed, oh, did I ever believe. But both times Billy placed his hands on my head and called upon the Lord, Nothing happened. I felt nothing. He would end up doing the old forehead push, and being the pushover that I was, I dutifully fell to the ground. After all, I didn't want to embarrass either of us by staying on my feet. Billy prophesied over my friends, too. One was going to become rich, another was going to work in healthcare, 
and yet another would have their voice heard as far as the east is from the west, from the treetops to the heavens, all in the name of the gospel. When he turned to me, however, he had nothing to say. But my reflex response kicked in immediately. Just wait, be patient. God will answer all in God's time. Then came 1996, the high watermark of my spirituality. Something happened in June on my 22nd birthday. I was helping a friend named Chris with his summer painting business. We were two stories up, prepping some windows. The last thing I remember, we were goofing off by singing the Hallelujah Chorus. I can't for the life of me remember why, but apparently God didn't appreciate the joke because the next thing I knew, I was in an ambulance spitting teeth out of my mouth. I found out later the scaffolding we were on collapsed, sending Chris and I crashing to the concrete below. I must have been knocked out pretty good because I don't remember any of it. I was released from the hospital three days later with a concussion, much needed dental work, and the loss of my sense of smell. But Chris wasn't nearly as fortunate. He remained in a coma for almost a month. The doctors weren't sure what kind of condition he would be in if he ever regained consciousness. Incredibly though, Chris did wake up. And not only that, he went home without suffering any lasting negative effects. Both of us were back to work painting by the end of July. We visited a few churches and regaled the congregations with our testimony of how God snatched us from the jaws of death. The Lord had saved my life yet again. There was simply no other explanation for it. God did have a plan for my life. It just did not involve my nose working properly. That summer, my mom gave me a wonderful book called Like a Mighty Wind by Mel Terry. It told the story of how his small, stuffy Presbyterian church in Indonesia was transformed when the fire of the Holy Spirit fell upon the congregation, just like on the day of Pentecost. I was amazed by his stories of healing, resurrection, even walking on water. It was like the Book of Acts came to life in the 20th century. To me, the book confirmed everything I believed, that God was still moving among his people without any regard for one's denomination or tradition. What God looked for was simple faith, faith like mine. One particular tale really moved me. A missionary team in Timor gathered Catholic idols in a local church, and after a moment of prayer, God struck the statues with a bolt of fire. The idols burned into a pile of ash without the flames harming anything else in the building. Well, I began to feel convicted there were idols in my life that needed to be burned. Maybe this was the reason I was given the book in the first place. So one fateful afternoon, I gathered my cassette tapes like Depeche Mode and Def Leppard, my Super Nintendo Doom cartridge, and yes, even my beloved collection of Batman comic books, laid them all in the middle of my bedroom and asked the Lord to burn them. I truly believed he would do it, that he wanted to do it, and that despite the laws of physics, the fire would not consume anything else in that small room other than the idols just like Elijah and the priests of Baal. I called upon the Lord and waited, and prayed and worshiped, and waited some more. And yet nothing happened. So after a while, I did the next best thing. I threw all the stuff in a dumpster. Be patient. All in God's time. Just wait. God will answer you. Be patient. But this time, I wasn't consoled by the excuses. I had done what I thought the Lord wanted me to do. The Bible said God was not a respecter of persons, so why would he show me the wonders he worked in Mel Terry's life if he wasn't willing to do the same in mine as well? What was I missing? What was I doing wrong? Why was I being excluded from experiencing the things of God? I didn't have any answers. Mary was a member of our Christian fellowship group that year. I didn't know it at the time, but she had muscular dystrophy, and almost overnight she became completely blind. This shocked all of us. I mean, how could this happen? We were determined that this attack of the enemy would not stand. Since God worked everything for the good to those who loved him, I firmly believed that Mary's suffering would be temporary. I believe God had given her this burden for a time so that her eventual healing would spark a revival on campus. Hundreds of souls would be saved as a result of this miracle. What Satan meant for evil, God would use for good. 
And so when Mary returned to school, it was not by chance that one of the visiting speakers hailed from a charismatic church. In fact, he was the very first charismatic speaker invited to our group in years. Everything was aligning perfectly. After the service, he prayed for Mary. We all did. And incredibly enough, she was healed. Well, okay, she was still blind, but the speaker insisted God was healing her at that very moment. It was now up to the Lord when he would complete his work. It could take a couple days, weeks, months, but God is good, right? This so-called healing didn't look anything like I'd seen in the Bible. Even compared to the two-part healing Jesus performed in Mark 8, at least that blind guy was given the ability to see right away. How could God be healing Mary if she couldn't see? It's been 18 years since Mary was quote-unquote healed, and her sight is no better than it was in 1996. I guess all she really received that night was false hope. The following year, though, the brass heavens finally seemed to break open for me. I was one of eight young people selected from across the country to run a summer youth program at a large church in Washington State. I immediately saw this as the hand of God, because several years earlier, I had received words of knowledge from three separate people that I was going to be used to minister to the youth. The Apostle Paul taught, In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. My selection was a clear sign that my mission from God was about to begin. There was only one problem. Within two days of my arrival, I realized I really didn't like youth ministry. Oh, don't get me wrong, the kids were great. They were well-behaved, respectful. Honestly, you couldn't have asked for a nicer bunch of high school students. The issue was entirely with me. I simply had no desire to spend time with the group or build relationships with them individually which is a pretty big problem since building relationships is what youth ministry is all about. Needless to say, I spent those three months in Washington State just trying to get by and counting the days until I returned home. You know, it's amazing to think how I put so much stock in what other people thought I should do or what I thought God wanted me to do and yet spent so little time figuring out for myself what I wanted to do. I guess in the end, I got what I deserved, but unfortunately, those kids deserved better. When my wife and I got married, we tried to get pregnant within the first couple years. We didn't succeed, so we sought the help of medical specialists to see if they could identify the problem. During that time period, a family friend brought some wonderful news. God had given them a prophetic word that we were going to give birth to a young warrior princess, like Xena, only she would grow up to be a mighty warrior for God. If you don't get the Xena reference, you probably did not grow up in the 90s. Another friend confirmed that message and said he would be surprised if we weren't already pregnant. My wife and I welcomed the news. After so much concern, it was good to know God was still our advocate. I always wanted to have a daddy's little girl. I think I had my heart set on the name Alana. I could just picture what she was going to look like. All curls, smiles, and brown eyes. Well, 13 years and three boys later, we stopped waiting for our little Xena to show up. At this point, it would take a small miracle for that to happen. The medical advice we received was a resounding success. The words of knowledge, however, not so much. The new church my wife and I started to attend held an annual church planting school that lasted two semesters. It was meant to equip believers with the tools they might need if they ever started their own church or went on a mission. I of course had no interest in planting churches or doing anything pastoral, but while we were dating, my wife spent a year in youth with a mission and she thought the church planting course might be a good way for us to bridge the gap. One weekend, a group specializing in spiritual warfare came to teach the class. They had us write down any afflictions or ailments we had on a slip of paper. The plan was to pray over the papers and ask God to show them which problem, if any, might be resolved through deliverance. The only physical issue I could think of was the loss of smell from the painting accident, so I wrote that down. I'd already tried surgery in the past, but it hadn't helped, so my only recourse was to hope that God would heal me one day. 
The next morning we found out the group prayed together and my name had been chosen. By this time though, I think my enthusiasm was slightly tempered. I still believed in the power of God, of course, but the failures I had seen in the recent past were beginning to gnaw at me. However, I thought, hey, maybe this was God's plan all along. He had brought me to the end of myself after all of my earlier expectations were shattered and now he would use my old injury to bring glory to his name. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, out of all the people in the class, he chose to help me. Finally, I was going to see his wonders. That night, the spiritual warfare experts brought me up front. I closed my eyes, they laid hands on me, and prayed. And nothing happened. So they prayed and prayed some more. They bound spirits of darkness and called upon the Lord's name and did everything they thought they should do. And still no change. And since nothing was working, they even attempted to bind the spirit of smell. Yes, I kid you not, the spirit of smell. Somehow I can't imagine Father Marin shouting, the odor of Christ compels you. Well, by that point, I had had enough. I was angry, embarrassed, and more than a little frustrated. How could those idiots have thought God wanted to heal me without actually healing me? How could their discernment be so off? What kind of game was this? Well, as far as I was concerned, I was done seeking the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Although I doggedly maintained a belief that God could and did interact with his creation, I relegated signs and wonders to extremely rare events. Even the painting accident began to lose some of its luster. I mean, if God had intervened, why did I crack my head and lose one of my senses? Why were half of my teeth shattered? Why had Chris been in a coma? If God was protecting us, shouldn't we have survived the fall completely unscathed? After all, when God protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they didn't come out of the furnace suffering second-degree burns. Was Daniel pulled out of the lion's den with claw marks on his body? Of course not. I just couldn't shake the uneasy truth that the supernatural works I had seen and experienced did not in any way resemble the examples found in the Bible. For every headache God had healed, there were 30 more he had ignored. Something was very wrong. I was in my basement watching Superman 3. Okay, look, I was scraping the bottom of my Netflix queue. Please don't judge. Anyway, Richard Pryor was doing something annoying when the phone rang. It was my mom, and she couldn't wait to tell me the news. Ken was walking. Ken was one of my oldest church friends. He had been born with spina bifida, a congenital disorder that robbed him of the use of his legs. His entire life had been spent on crutches, but now he was walking. How did this happen? Well, apparently Ken had attended some kind of Christian worship service when a young girl prayed for his healing. Now Ken had been prayed for many times before. After so many unanswered prayers and false prophecies, I was amazed he still had any patience left for that sort of thing. But this time when she prayed, something happened. For the first time in his life, he had feeling in his legs and he was able to walk without the aid of crutches. My mom invited me to come over to see him, and believe me, I couldn't run to my car fast enough. I remember speeding down the highway, praising God for pouring out his mercy on my friend. Never mind my past disappointments with the Holy Ghost. As the scripture said, the blind receive their sight and the lame will walk. This miracle was straight out of the New Testament. When I arrived at the house, Ken and his family were there, and he was walking. However, as much as I wanted to share in their joy, I just couldn't shake the feeling that something wasn't right. Sure, he was walking, but he didn't have the range of movement most of us have. He seemed to be balancing more than anything else. Of course, under normal circumstances, that would be expected. After all, it could take years of physical therapy for most adults to learn to use their legs. However, a divine healing is not a normal circumstance. When Peter healed the crippled man in Acts 3, despite being lame from birth, 
the man leaped to his feet and ran. And this was without therapy or even knowing how to walk. Well, Ken couldn't come close to running, and I doubt he could even bend his legs at the knees. Look, I want to be clear. I was very happy Ken could feel his legs, no matter how or why it happened. The fact that he could traverse a room without crutches for the first time in his life must have felt truly liberating. So, in the end, my personal disappointment is of little consequence. Ken deserves to walk. And if he's happy, that's really all that matters. But when I saw him a few years ago, he was using a cane to walk around. And based on a few recent Facebook pictures, it appears that he's been forced to use crutches again, even though he's only in his mid-30s. So, was Ken really healed? As much as I want to believe it for his sake, my eyes tell me otherwise. It seems to be yet another half measure, like the painting accident was. It certainly didn't resemble the healings we find in the New Testament, and that is supposed to be the standard by which we judge such things. Every proverbial coffin has its final nail. Luis Santiago was mine. About eight months after becoming a closet atheist, our church welcomed in the new year with a week of prayer and fasting. Lewis was invited to preach and minister to the congregation through healing. During the service, he called out one of the older members in the congregation and asked him if he was able to stand. Lewis said he noticed there was something wrong with the man's hip when he first walked in that morning. The old man shook his head and told Lewis the problem was with his leg. That's what the hospital had diagnosed. But Lewis insisted something was attached to the hip that needed to be dealt with. So he rebuked the evil spirit, telling it to go, and he spoke healing and other nonsense. He then asked the old guy if one leg was shorter than the other, but the gentleman dismissed that idea immediately. Lewis's prophetic discernment was now batting O for two. He then asked the guy how he was feeling on a scale of one to ten, but the old man didn't provide a clear answer. So Lewis suggested that everyone pray again. You could tell the old guy felt really uncomfortable about being put on the spot, especially when he wasn't seeing any results. Since the overall atmosphere in the room was getting a bit uncomfortable, Lewis decided to widen his net and ask if anyone else in the congregation was suffering from hip or alignment issues. After all, in a room of 150 people, the odds were pretty good that someone would have hip issues. At first, no one responded, but after a few awkward moments, a couple people stood up. Then commenced another boilerplate prayer about spirits of infirmity and pain being cast out. He asked the people standing to do something with their hips they couldn't do before. When he didn't get a clear response, he asked if anyone felt 20% better. <laughs> I thought to myself, really, 20%? That's how far the bar has been lowered? No one said a word. So Lewis decided to pray again, saying that he knows God wants our bodies to be healed. I sat there and thought, dude, please know your audience before making claims like that. The woman sitting in the wheelchair in the back of the church has been paralyzed for the last two years because she was struck by Julian Baer syndrome. Forget about hip pain. If anyone needs healing in this building, it's her. Heal her for the love of God. But of course, hip pain was the only thing on the menu that morning. Now one woman claimed her pain went from 10 down to 5. I don't know how anyone could actually measure that. But finally, success! Lewis swooped in and immediately told her to keep believing that God would increase her healing and to keep checking herself out along the way. <laughs> Kinda sounds like Mary's healing all over again, doesn't it? About a year later, I saw the old man with the leg problem shopping at Walmart, and he was using a walker. I could give many other examples, but I've gone on long enough already. There are those who might argue my expectations of God were unrealistic or even unbiblical. Some might say I wasn't patient enough. After all, Abraham had to wait 25 years to see the Lord's promise fulfilled. I understand those arguments. Trust me, I've considered them many times before. The charismatic gifts of the Spirit operating in today's church was one of my foundational beliefs. 
This idea informed my understanding of God, His character, and the reliability of the Scriptures. To believe in the continuance of God's power and yet fail to see it operating in the church at large, to be bombarded time and time again with false prophecies, half-healings, and silence, well, Proverbs 13 says hope deferred makes the heart sick. I think the Bible got that right, at least. My heart was sick with disappointment, so I let go of the Holy Ghost as far as his miraculous gifts were concerned. For several years, I was a believer whose belief in God barely resembled the wide-eyed optimist I had been when I was first saved, and this change would eventually spill over into all areas of my Christian walk, especially how I viewed the church. And the church will be the subject of my next video in the series.